turma, pô de turma, hein? Olha, turma! Shaka was now truly a Zulu leader and had proved beyond any doubt his right to the honor of regimental command. The soldiers of Dingis Wire's crack regiment endowed their new and brave commander with the highest status and greatest honors a regimental warrior could earn from the king's small but potent army. Leadership. The cup of the leopard and the child of King Daba. Who can trust the lion? Because it's only you who has the power. Only you can defeat the lion. You are above the lion. Dingis Wayo wanted a more powerful military base so that he could protect and extend his small Zulu-speaking domain. The inclusion of the strong and popular Shaka as a commander gave Dingis Wayo an advantage. Dingis Wayo needed a strong army to defend his people in particular from the Undwandwe, a tribe of the north. Shaka, now a regimental leader, would confront the ruthless Mwandwe tribe during an invasion, beating them, but letting them go on Dingis Wayo's word. Shaka had been unable to fully implement his new ideas in warfare. He would need time to train his men in the use of the assegai and the disciplined attacking formations that would characterize his military genius in later battles with the Undwandwe. But warfare would not be Shaka's only concern. Later, Dingis Wayo would be tricked into visiting the Undwandwe encampment by Zwide, their king. There, Dingis Wayo would be executed. This left the Zulus without a leader, and Shaka, who had proved himself against the Ndwandwes, was the obvious choice. At Shaka's coronation, the regiments of the former king, Dingis Wayo, stood by to ensure that no upstart from any neighboring tribes would interfere, as Shaka's kingdom was still very small, measuring only 10 miles square. It was possible to walk within any of Shaka's new territory within one hour. The tiny kingdom was surrounded by many other clans infinitely bigger and stronger than his own, including the formidable Ndwandwe tribe. Shaka's coronation ceremony would last several days. Is Training was harsh. Warriors would learn a Spartan-like discipline to carry them into battle. Among other things, they would have to learn to walk on burning fires with their bare feet. Oh, yeah, 
Shaka was honor bound to hand over to Umvundlana a kingdom which he did. It was called the Biela tribe. Prince Kalanja is their eldest statesman today. Umvundlana celebrated his gift of land from the great king Shaka. Immediately he began a gearing dance, knowing that he had earned his praise song that survives until this day. Shaka did not want to confront the invading Ndwandwe directly. He continued using psychological warfare and guerrilla tactics to defeat the now very demoralized Ndwandwe army. Shaka kept on moving his army around the countryside of the Zulu kingdom, leading the Ndwandwe into the deep and dark forests. Now Shaka and his men were ready to take on the mighty but demoralized Ndwandwe army. Everyone was very scared of Shaga because he was a very powerful Zulu king. Whenever he attacked, thousands of people would die. Shaka's warriors, the Impi, moved to a battle position. Shaka. His desire to defeat the Undwandwe had been realized. The Zulus celebrated their victory. Shaka thanked all his men for the successful defense of the Zulu nation. There was no need to search for cowards, for they had all fought like lions. Pointing to the ranks, he said, Those who are not here are eating the earth that we might live. Let us give the bereaved the mothers and wives, a double measure to take the taste of bitterness from the mouths of the sorrowing one. Warriors gaped in astonishment as Shaka announced the rewards amongst the living for poor and wealthy alike. In contrast to rewards, the queen mother of the Undwandwe was summarily tried and put to death by Shaka, who threw her into a hut with a hyena. Shaka asked if she had magical powers over wild animals as a witch doctor, and her reply of yes sealed her fate. The door to the hut was sealed, and over a three-day period, the savage beast would take pieces of her body. His own men became anxious about the appalling screams of the Queen Mother. Only then would Shaka approve for the hut to be burnt. <laughs> The Zulu people worship Shaka. The regiment sat outside Nandi's hut and Shaka, shocked by her worsening illness, was unable to speak for two hours until the end. When Nandi, the Queen Mother, finally passed away.
Shaka was broken by the death of his mother. Those who had gathered around the camp began to wail and many tore at their clothes. In the year 1818, tribal war rages in southern Africa. Shaka, king of the Zulus, summons his warriors. Among them, a boy of 18, far from home and facing his first battle. Training for all warriors, novices and veterans is now relentless. The men spend their days practicing how to move as one. More than commands are being mastered. The men are forging the bond that keeps any army together, comradeship. Serving in Shaka's army is risky. Disobeying Shaka is fatal. For failing to enlist, the penalty is execution. For losing a spear, execution. For cowardice in battle, execution. But a Zulu did not have to be a soldier to fear death. Shaka's barber, for example, would pay with his life for the slightest nick in the royal chin. By the time Shaka's rule of terror ended with his assassination in 1828, he had executed thousands of his own people. The king distinguishes veterans by giving them white shields. Those who have not earned one carry a black shield. To distinguish himself, Shaka wields a white one with a single black spot in the center. In his headband, he wears a long blue feather from the tail of a lorry bird. The biting chill of dawn gives way to the fearsome heat of mid-morning. Across the world in the 19th century, the popular image of the Zulu is of a naked spear-wielding savage, brutal and merciless to his white neighbors and his own kind alike. Oh, man, what the... 
the crossing of the shields was an event that would lead to further confusion between two rival sons that would result in a Zulu war. The two armies eventually met on a wet day on a battlefield by the flooded banks of the Tugela River. Mboyazi and his 7,000 men, who were hopelessly outnumbered, was positioned with his back toward the small of the river. Mboyazi, who was Mpande's most beloved son, was told by the king to go to the whites and seek assistance, to fight Ketwayo's men. Because the rains had started early, escape across the flooded Tugela River was impossible. Many more warriors and men from the surrounding villages had flocked to join the ranks of the regiments of Quechuaio. Umboyazi, despite his poor situation, was determined to hold his position against the horns of Quechuaio's increasing number of impi warriors. Kechwayo formed his regiments in the traditional Shaka horn formation. This looked like the head of a cow. Two horns, one right, one left, and the head or chest. The idea was to attack the enemy by rushing towards them. The horns on the outside will encircle the enemy left in the middle with no escape. The battle was swift and decisive. was set up between British officials and some of Quechuayo's headmen, or Induna. Quechuayo did not want to be forced into a war with the British. The Zulus have 30 days to lay down their weapons and 20 days to hand over the sons of Sihaya, who have taken the women from the police kraal this side of the Buffalo River. A payment of 600 cattle, a fine is also to be made. The headmen were dismayed, knowing full well that the conditions could never be met in time or in practice. The event was called 
the ultimatum tree. It was a meeting that could not have been more like a declaration of war. It was made in the full knowledge that Quechuayo could never comply with the conditions. Freer had the power and the authority to settle the Zulu problem once and for all, and was going to use it. Britain was at that time heavily engaged in a war in Afghanistan and was reluctant to enter into another with the formidable Zulu. I have my orders. I am going to read out now a further set of conditions that I'd like adhered to. The Zulu nation will lay down its arms. Although they had not fought for two decades, Quechuayo gambled the whole of his army on one single confrontation with the British. Later in the morning, the Zulu could see the weakness of the long extending line of the British defense. Information was quickly conveyed to the Zulu generals to move swiftly. The general of the Zulu army was Nukshingiz Wayo Kemaholi, age 68. Dabala Munzi, the king's brother, who would later lead the attack against Rourke's drift, has frequently been mistaken as being the general of the day. The Illustrated London News. War has actually commenced between the British government in South Africa, represented by Sir Bartle Freer, with Lord Chelmsford commanding the military forces, and the king of the Zulu, called Ketchwayo. His dominions are situated north of the British province of Natal on the eastern seacoast. Moving swiftly onto the escarpment, the youngest impi looked down on the plains singing war songs. British soldiers were taken completely by surprise, some undressed, many unarmed. Many soldiers had as much as six paces between each man, shoulder to shoulder, on the long line of defence. The Zulu army strode into attack at great speed. All of the tensions from the lack of war were erased as they advanced towards the enemy. did not say we must not attack. He said we must attack. Attack!
Also, bullets could only be issued by the quartermaster. When we saw that the camp was gone, and that our men began to try to get away by twos and threes, I said to Henderson, what are we going to do? Our only chance is to run for it and dash through. We started. He took the right, I took the left, and rode slap at the enemy. One fellow seized hold of my horse's bridle, and I made a stab at him with my rifle. But the man caught hold of it and pulled it out of my hand, which at the same time made my horse rear and cleared me of the man. I then only had my revolver, and I saw a Zulu right in my course. I rode at him and shot him in the neck. Every man who had a horse attempted to escape towards the river. Those who had none died where they stood. We have lost a great many of our men. There were 20,000 come down on us. They took possession of our camp. There were about 15 or 20 to each one of us and the fighting altogether lasted 13 hours, and the greater part of it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and I think myself very lucky that I have escaped. I thank God that I have been spared from the sword. I expect you'll see more of it in the papers, but they generally print them wrong out here, so they will be at home. I would describe the battlefield to you, but the sooner I get it off my mind, the better. It was a pity to see about 800 white men lying on the field, cut up to pieces and stripped naked. The resulting carnage after the battle was much misunderstood by journalists of the time. The Zulu, as was their custom, tore open the stomachs of their enemy. This was to release their spirits to the heavens, so that the Zulu would not be pursued by their ghosts. The young drummer boys were not old enough to be considered warriors and therefore didn't receive a warrior's death. Instead, they were hung on meat hooks. Because in going to Rourke's Drift, he defied the king's instructions to cross over into Natal. He was not supposed to cross the Buffalo River into Natal. Quechuayo was aware that the British held a defensive position at Rourke's Drift. If he had wanted to attack Peter Maritzburg, the colony's capital in Natal, he could have easily cut his way through. But as in the very beginning of the war, Quechuayo saw his victory at Izandluana as an opportunity for peace. Cajuayo did not want to shed unnecessary blood. No less than 20 messages were sent to the British asking for peace during the five months of war that was to follow. Two hours after the Battle of Izandluana, the right horn led by Dablo Menzi was well on its way to Rourke's Drift. They were men who wanted to see battle, but had not taken part in the main battle at Izandluana. They were veteran warriors of past campaigns and felt cheated of glory. They did not want to have their prowess and courage undermined. 
they needed to prove to themselves that they too were noble warriors of Cachuayo. Double Amanza's column was now moving at an unstoppable pace. Bloodthirsty warriors anxious for a fight. <laughs> The regimental names of the Zulu are, are very poetic and very beautiful. In a way, in juxtaposition to the fact that they are very military and, and hard people, we get fascinating names like Indri Yangwe, House of the Leopard, and even contemporary regiments to this day. The prince, for example, is called Ponolindohu, the elephant tusk, and the contemporaries of my grandfather were Hai Lingwang. Song of the Crocodile. They are beautiful names. You've got Kipping Kuns, take out the bull. You've got a Fuge Bambe, grab up and wake up and seize it. You have uh, Ufasim, Shaka's crack regiment, which is the haze or the mirage because they appeared almost out of nowhere. On arrival at the British side of the river, the captains formed the warriors into their respective regiments. They then proceeded to Rourke's Drift, a short distance away. Double Amanzi and his regiments had appeared on the ridge of the escarpment four hours after the Battle of Isandlwana. The terrible emotional release of battle was here at last. Chaplain, Chaplain Smith, tried to maintain calm, issuing bullets and reminding the frightened men of the presence of God. South and northwest perimeter fences were attacked by hundreds of the Undi regiments time and time again. They were repelled by repeated volley fire from the Martini Henry rifles. Many Zulu would fall and hide as they charged the temporary but secure ramparts. Spear clashed against rifle barrels and bayonets in fierce hand to hand fighting. Zulu assault met with disciplined resistance from the brave, outnumbered soldiers. The Zulu dashed in their hundreds to both attack and seek refuge from unrelenting rifle power, hiding in any available building, including the hospital and rear wall of the storeroom. At the same time, assaults continued on the weakening outer perimeter. The soldiers were slowly losing their ground.
Chaplain Smith continued to encourage the men to stifle their fears. He issued cartridges and talked of God between the violent assaults on the wall. front wall, Corporal Shees of the Natal native contingent would earn his Victoria Cross. Throughout the entire night, a small band of defenders protected their position against the backlight of the burning hospital. Just as one enemy would fall, a new one would spring into the assault. A continuous body of warriors tried to break down the resolve of this small band of soldiers. Other soldiers had retreated to defend the inner wall. The Zulu had control of the buildings, the gardens and the outer wall, with many more in reserve waiting to blood themselves in the fearful battle. Fighting would continue into the night. Bodies would hurl themselves from out of the darkness at the remaining soldiers, now defending the inner perimeter, the second line of defense. At 8.15 a.m., when dawn did arrive, gunfire and terrifying screaming subsiding. English troops were seen advancing towards the mission. The Zulu retreated. Rourke's drift was safe. Chelmsford arrived at Ulundi on the 2nd of July and by the 4th had arranged his troops into an impenetrable human square of some 4,000 men. Additional cavalry, cannon, rockets and Gatling guns. The Gatling gun was an import from America. It was the first time these guns had been used in land warfare. At 8.30 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1879, at Ulundi, the royal home of King Cachuayo, the Zulus charged into a human inferno of lead and cannon shell. The Zulu, historically, had lost battles where their enemy had used a strong defensive position which they were forced to attack. Superior firepower meant the British army was destined for victory at Alundi. 1,000 Zulu died and thousands were wounded. On the 1st of September 1879, the Zulu surrendered to the British armed forces six years to the day after Cachuayo's coronation by the British. The opposition leader in her government, Gladstone, stated, we have a record of 10,000 Zulu slain for no other offense than their attempt to defend their hearth and homes, their wives and children.
Zulus today still pay their respects to the Valley of the Kings, the burial place of great warriors and chiefs of the people of the heavens, the Zulu. It is an enduring fact that even today, every Zulu man and boy in South Africa sings beautifully, maintaining a rich oral tradition that contains the history of the people of the heavens. In contrast, the battle site of Britain's most terrible defeat of colonial history may be washed away. Isandlwana may be flooded to make way for a dam. Rourke's Drift remains a Swedish missionary post that is shameful of the battle that took place in its holy grounds. Sadly, the grave of Shaka Zulu is covered by a road intersection crossing and is surrounded by buildings occupied by Asian traders. resisting British domination, and it ended with the British destroying the Zulus as a nation. Asang Luana was the first of the battles, and won the British lost. 1,500 British troops, mostly men from the Welsh Regiment, the 24th, faced 25,000 Zulus. By dusk, the British were annihilated. 858 died, and nearly 4,000 Zulus. Many Welshmen of the former 24th Regiment had flown from Britain to see the battlegrounds. Our, our own day, it's our regimental day, and uh, one which we honour throughout the regiment. I think uh, it may be starting all over again behind you. Yeah. <laughs> the Zulus today were dressed exactly as they were in 1879. The colours of their shields and the different headdresses indicated the separate regiments. And watched by their king and their paramount chief, Gacha Botelezi, they reenacted their preparations for attack. They came over the hill as the Welsh lookout shouted, Watch it, lads, they're as black as hell and as thick as grass. Rourke's Drift made British military history and 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded. Lost to war a century ago, but are today the most powerful black tribe in southern Africa because there are more than five million of them and they outnumber every other tribal grouping, including the whites. United, they pose a real threat to the survival of white domination in the long term. The Zulu king was here, but more important, the prime minister, Chief Gacha Butalezi, who has probably the greatest following of any political figure in South Africa today. They took this occasion seriously. Because it was here, the Zulu warriors inflicted on the Redcoats the worst defeat in British military history. More British officers fell here than at Waterloo. Not one white man was left alive on the plain of Isandlwana. The next battle after Isandlwana was Rourke Strift, where the Zulus suffered a terrible beating. And then later, Olundi, the battle which effectively crushed the mighty Zulu war machine. So Isandlwana was not only the Zulus' greatest victory, it was their last. 
The Zulus are engaged in a different kind of fight now to win back some of the independence and self-respect they had a hundred years ago. Butalezi refuses to accept the form of independence offered by the South African government. And although the Africana government talks of reconciliation, when I spoke to Butalezi, he made it clear he does not reject the alternative of revolution if they cannot win what they seek by negotiation. We are at the crossroads. It's either that, in fact, in concrete terms, the, the, the reconciliation that we are seeking, you know, uh, actually um, materializes or else God, God help us. Butalezi has said if his people fail to win a share of that power peacefully, he might one day expect the British and the West to help. And if there is to be another war between the Zulu and the white man, the British should be clearly on their side.